Welcome, everyone. This is our first Tucker Medical Ritual Gym Ask Us Anything on Fasting. And I say it'll be, it's our first one because we've had such an overwhelming response of, of questions and participants that we think we could probably do half a dozen of these hour long sessions. And uh, literally we've had over a hundred signups and twice as many questions. So I'm gonna try to go quick and expect that with all the questions that we received, we've tried to organize them into some topics. So your specific question may not get answered, but please use the, the chat and the, uh, the chat function, which we'll monitor and try to come back to any questions or add them to follow-ups for future events. Uh, quickly, let me point out that we've got uh, Brad Robinson, uh, CEO and co-founder of Ritual Gyms, who's joining us tonight, along with uh, the Tucker Medical Nutrition Team, Ashrafi Bhagat, nutrition coach, Kartika T, our wonderful uh, oncology and general metabolic dietitian nutritionist, and our newest member, Bonnie who is a uh, digital health and uh, expert and nutritionist dietitian as well. With that, uh, I'll let everybody, if you guys want to do your own intros when you start talking. I also want to share with everyone out there, we are sharing our personal and professional experiences that our discussions today are not medical advice, that we're going to talk about how we use information and how fasting being one extreme of nutritional manipulation, how we feel and what we may measure as we talk about diabetes or liver disease or something else. And I would also say that we're, we all have an element of self-experimentation or biohacking to try to maximize uh, whatever benefit we want. And I, that's a theme that we'll come back to because some of the questions are open-ended and it really depends on your purpose. So. Um, the other thing, the next thing that I'm going to jump into, I'll give you a teaser. We're going to cover what is fasting, what is the terminology around fasting, some of the origins around fasting, exercise and athleticism in fasting, the when and the who, as in the circadian, the gender, the timing of fasting, all sorts of metabolic health, diabetes, liver, autoimmune, oncology, cancer, chemotherapy, supplements, immunity, autophagy, to name a few. So that's what's coming ahead. With that, I'm going to start to pitch it out to the team. Let's do terminology. Uh, Bonnie, um, let's, some of the terminology out there, people talk about 16, 8, 5, 2, dry fast, wet fast, and autophagy. Um, what are some of these things? Um, 16-8 is um, the fast where you're basically not eating for 16 hours and the other eight hours of the day you are allowed to eat um, and that's one form of intermittent fasting or some people in the scientific community call it time-restricted feeding. Um, another in intermittent fasting would be the 5-2 diet where you can eat normally for five days of the week and the other two days, usually non-consecutive, you can have um, a range of 500 to 600 calories. Um, and that would be kind of more in line with um, the scientific community's terminology of um, intermittent fasting. Um, so the other question in terms of the wet or dry fasting, um, most people would do um, wet fast, meaning like you can still take fluids. Um, that would be the more conventional approach um, and the one where it's dry fast is usually commonly seen in religious fasting um, for example Ramadan um, and that would be like no water at all but typically that only lasts for about 16 hours or so and it's more for spiritual purposes rather than for health benefits because um, you can basically get all the metabolic benefits just with um, a wet fast with that, uh, Ashrafi or Kartika, do you guys want to comment on any of the religious components and spiritual components? That was the origin of, of our idea to start a, an AMA on fasting and how we could help people during Ramadan. But do you want to add to what Bonnie said? Yeah, Ashrafi, go ahead and then I'll follow. 
Uh, yeah, uh, what I'd like to add is uh, probably, yes, I, I agree with Dr. Tucker that that's the origin and, uh, you know, the, um, and that's how fasting started. But uh, what uh, I, I think Bonnie uh, also forgot to mention uh, autophagy. So I just wanted to say that autophagy is something where uh, you fast uh, typically for, uh, it starts between 18 to 20 hours, but the best results are uh, 48 to 72 hours. And autophagy is basically a process where the body uh, is uh, repairing and renewing uh, cells and eliminating the, uh, the waste material from the cell. So that's autophagy. And going back to uh, uh, fasting as origin, um, so we also have where, you know, uh, we had many periods of um, uh, starvation or war and famine uh, along with religious fasting. So th these are some of the origins of where fasting started. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like even with um, Ramadan fasting, I think depending on the region that someone is. So I have some friends who live uh, places where, you know, daylight savings are changing. So if sunrise and sunset goes far to far apart, it can actually be as long as 20 hours. And that's the form of dry fasting that's done during Ramadan. And, um, it, you know, we had a conversation about this yesterday, it started with hunter gatherers going for extended periods of time, as Brad, you were saying, uh, just hunting for food and then religion came about and then they did religious fasting so yeah different forms of fasting that all came from you know um thousands of years ago brad hunter gather <laughs> yeah i mean it's a it is it is it wasn't called fasting back in the day it was called i didn't get the kill so i don't have dinner tonight uh, Failed which hunting. was the way <laughs> yeah, uh, which was the way, you know, humans lived until very, very recently, if you look at the spectrum. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, on a, on a human spectrum and a human timeline, it's not that new of a thing. Religion's been around a long time and, and people have been missing meals for, for even longer than that. Yeah. So I don't want to assume that everyone uh, listening right now, you know, is at the same level of understanding or interest in fasting. And just to make sure... Um, when we say fasting, we contrast it with a fed state, that there's the fed state you, you've eaten and you have fresh energy in your body. In the fasting state, you don't have fresh energy in your body and you create energy either from stored uh, carbohydrates, glucose and glycogen, or you create energy from fat. But a key theme that'll pop up over and over is that in the fed state, the hormone insulin is gonna be elevated and that the hormone insulin <laughs> has a few functions in the body. First of all, moving glucose, your carbohydrate intake, from the blood into the cells where it can be used. Second, the insulin is preventing the um, uh, excess insulin is, is causing, I apologize, is causing the creation of fat. So that if you have more energy than you need from a meal or uh, chronically, it's creating fat, storing fat as uh, carbohydrate is fat in triglycerides. And third, it's preventing the burning of existing fat. So that's one of the reasons that when fasting, you have to sort of go a certain distance, a certain amount of time before you can really kick into either a ketosis state, a uh, high or low ketosis, but to begin to burn fat. And so that's the, the fed state. And it tends to be more of the metabolic problem we see today. Fasting is the opposite. It lowers insulin and it allows the burning of fat. Um, okay, a couple of other things. Let's start really getting into. Here was a common question. You guys ready? This is supposed to be all about fasting, but who cannot or should not fast? Are there any absolute contraindications to fasting? And are there relative contraindications to fasting? I'll stick in the same order. Uh, Bonnie, you first, and then pass it to one of your colleagues. It depends on what type of fasting you're doing. It's hard to say you definitely can't do it if you have these conditions. Um, but I think the main one would probably be people who have a history of eating disorders, especially anorexia, bulimia, um, binge eating disorder, because that might perpetuate some of those kind of binge and then um, restrict cycles that we don't want. So anyone with um, a not so positive relationship with food might want to talk to their health professional first. Um, people who are underweight might also find it difficult to fast and 
gain weight, um, but it depends on, you know, what kind of, were they underweight all along? If they were, then if they can still, you know, fit in all their calories in a 16 or 20 hour, you know, fast frame, then that's actually possible as well. Um, and women who are pregnant or um, breastfeeding, it might be difficult to meet the increased nutrient requirements during those times. Um, and there are other ones where you might just need some precautions before starting. So, you know, if you have diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, um, if you have liver disease, kidney disease, um, or if you're an elite athlete, um, it might be difficult to squeeze in the protein and large volume of food that you require. Um, so those are just some examples. Great. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and Brad, what about like athletes? Like some of some of the people that you train or some of the people you train with, are they all suited for fasting? Uh, a very high output athlete, a uh, professional, you know, professional fighter or, or, you know, someone who's really dedicating their life and putting a lot of hours in and burning a lot more calories than your, your average Joe has a hard time already. Most people, especially if they're eating clean, getting a, an appropriate amount of calories and macronutrients. in. so in my world, that's definitely something we watch out for. And, and it can, you can keep digging yourself into a hole. You end up underfed and then underperforming and then a lot of things can start to fall apart. So uh, being athletes who are underfed or, or even non athletes, just people who are high output folks and tough jobs or, you know, triathletes on the weekends, they, they can have a hard time getting, uh, getting enough calories in. What about Ashrafi or Kartika? What about diabetics? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, um, so uh, children under the age of 18, uh, it's not yeah. recommended as well. And if you are uh, type 2 uh, diabetes, then because fasting puts you in a state of ketosis, so you might want to do that with a lot of caution under medical supervision and guidance and, uh, you know, have a glucose meter to monitor your uh, glucose levels. I so think you have type 1s. Yes, so type I one diabetics. Type one diabetics as well as with type two diabetes, they should monitor the glucose levels yeah. as well. I think that I think that they all should. Go ahead, Kartika. I think that kind of brings us to one of the questions that our participant uh, brought up, which is um, you know, type one diabetes. So when Dr. Tucker talked about like glucose and insulin, right? Your glucose goes up and insulin is the hormone that brings it back down. And for someone with type one diabetes, they don't have that regulation um, in check. And so they actually need very close glucose monitoring, like continuous glucose monitoring. Um, and when they are practicing um, fasting, it's not impossible, needs more close monitoring of the glucose. Um, and I think Dr. Tucker wants to add a little bit on that. I would just say on the type ones, because I mean, at, in the office, we've been really strong advocates for glucose monitors using um, what's called the Abbott Freestyle Libre, no connection to Abbott over here, but, um, that's not technically a continuous glucose meter. It's called a flash glucose meter. It only tells you your blood sugar when you ask it. If you're a type one diabetic, like a childhood diabetic, you have a, a more expensive uh, glucose meter that's going to give you an alert when it's low. And so a type one diabetic who wants to pursue fasting for any purpose, religious or metabolic or uh, personal challenge, absolutely requires medical supervision and a proper continuous glucose meter. Because as you said, Kartika, they, they only have one half of the balance. They got the glucagon, but they don't have the insulin. Yeah. The type twos, I think we all like the data and the monitoring, but yeah. we really need, um, the, the type twos need to get into ketosis, low grade ketosis to start burning fat and lower their insulin levels. That's and with the type twos as well, the only time where, you know, it depends on the medications that they're taking. Some medications put them at a risk for this diabetic ketoacidosis if they combine that with fasting, but other medications they're fine with. So you, you'll need some tweaking with the medications. And for the type twos, you can actually safely do the fasting as long as you have a discussion with the provider about the specific medications and how they help manipulate your blood sugars. Very good. Um, let's, we're, we're bouncing around a little bit. Uh, what about breaking a fast? So is there, it, I, I'm worried, Brad, you were talking about the other day, the, the reward function. I've just fasted for 24 hours. I deserve this. 
just like I, I, I went to the gym, I deserve this. <laughs> what, uh, how do you, what's okay to eat after a fast and what would be a big mistake? I'll, I'll tell you what has worked for me very well after you know 10 years or so of, of I've tried all different forms of fasting and intermittent fasting and long fasts. And I, and I have found that I consider myself pretty disciplined, but I, I, especially in the early days, still struggled with, I just hit my mark, it's time to gorge. And, uh, you know, and, and fasting is not a, not a cure-all for unhealthy eating. You still have to, still have to watch what you eat and, you know, maintain, make some good choices. So I have found that I, I go into the fast after a couple of days of, of low-carb eating or even, even keto-style eating, and I come out of the fast the same with, with very small meals. And that is just a personal workaround I have found to keep me from eating like a maniac uh, when I come out of a fast. So it, I just, I just keep the calories low. It just keeps me from, from gorging. And then, then I kind of uh, work my way into a more of a standard diet. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think any, uh, anybody who's already our patient knows that we're not advocates of snacking, <laughs> but I think when you're breaking a fast, sometimes it's good to start with a snack. <laughs> so you're not gorging bit. on a meal, <laughs> yeah, like a tiny bit, and then space it out a little bit. That'll be a good time to actually use a snack. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's one of those things that, you know, like everything in life or every new habit, it gets easier the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And now it's really not an issue. I can, I can go to, a, to have a meal in a restaurant to break my fast and not, you know, not embarrass myself. But there was a while where I had to, had to train myself a little bit better. <laughs> You have no self-control. Um, <laughs> Ashrafi, um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, and I think some of the patients you see this really common, but they're just sort of pointing out, like, I have gastric issues like reflux, and also um, a question that says, I'm on ketones, and, um, you know, it, which I assume they're taking powdered ketones and adding it in. How does that change of fast is is that really fasting if you're taking ketones and and does it also uh, contribute to acidity yeah uh, so uh so to answer the first question about if you have uh, acidity issues and you want to start fasting probably the best thing would be to start with a uh, a 16 8 uh, which Bonnie mentioned earlier which is time restricted feeding and uh, you know so that, that is a easier way to ease into fasting very gradually very slowly and uh, ensuring that you uh, you know uh, have you eat your uh, last meal which is if it's a dinner then at least three four hours before your bedtime so these things help so you can start with a 14 10 which means 14 hours of eating and 10 hours sorry 14 hours of not eating and 10 hours of uh, eating and then gradually move one to a 16 8 and uh, with ketones uh, yes so if you uh, if you are someone who is fast or who is doing a longer fast like a 24 hour fast and to prevent yourself from digressing the fast you can have some ketones but the but the ketones that we recommend are something like mct oil or coconut oil that's something which i would recommend so i'll, I'll i'd like to ask kartika what she thinks about that yeah, I think that, you know, with exogenous ketones, there is some evidence on like for athletes, uh, people who are really exercising already and they're using it to enhance their performance. But the best way to get like ketone production is by, you know, extended fasting and low carb eating. Uh, the best way to put your body into ketosis is, is by depriving it of energy for a significant amount of time, specifically carbohydrate. So if you truly want to get the benefits of fasting, even just taking out the low carb eating part of it, uh, probably just stick to fasting, no shortcuts. <laughs> and exercise. And yeah. exercise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you adding like, ketones also can like, you know, add in calories. So if your goal is weight loss, then yeah. it's not really going to help that. Well, let's, let's jump far ahead then, because we had a conversation about, is fasting about calories or is fasting about ketosis? Brad? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very common question. Is, am, am, I, am, I, am I losing weight and getting leaner because uh, I'm not eating for this extra four or six hours a day, so I'm just burning fat throughout this time? Or am I really just, just experiencing a, a caloric restriction and I'm, because my eating window is smaller, I'm not getting you know, my, my daily calories in, they're, they're short. 
And the discussion we had yesterday, which I agree with, we kind of all landed on, it's probably a little of both. Um, which, which I think, you know, as most things, nutrition, it's, it's not a, there's not a one right answer for everything. It's a, it's a spectrum and a, and a, and a cross paths, intersectional answers. And I think that's the same. So I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, and I think there's a third factor in that there's a psychology play that happens where you've accomplished this little goal. You made it 16 hours without eating. You feel good about yourself. And that springboards into, into other areas where you experience you know, have some discipline and make good choices. So I think there's, there's knock on effects that may, you may not see in a, in a peer reviewed study that a lot of people experience. So I think it's, it's probably a combination of all three of those things. It's, it's the ketosis, it's the, it's the restricted calories. And it's also, you probably make a little bit better choices throughout the day. If you, if you're putting this much work into fast, you're probably not going to go and chug down three beers and eat some ice cream later in the evening. It almost feels like that feels like that positive guilt that comes from exercising, right? Like if you've exercised, you feel a little bit guilty about making a poor food choice after that. Yeah, and I, I just like I ruined it. <laughs> but I do like I do like the positive psychology of it when yeah. people do something that is might be considered by some to be more extreme, but the idea that says because frankly, a lot of people who are doing fasting are doing it because they believe it is a weight loss, whereas I would describe a fat loss strategy. And so they're working on this self-improvement self, they're improving their health for a variety of reasons. And often they feel you know, marginalized at, you know, at a minimum because the world is judging them based on, on appearance and not on biology or judging them in ways and they, they might have negative feelings. And the reality is when you can say, I did this, and you haven't done that, that mm. really builds, uh, in, in my experience with patients, when you support them through this, it really builds confidence in what they can achieve. So yeah. I hate to see the sabotaging that occurs. Um, we, I know that we have 200 questions that were sent in. I know that we have a lot of stuff we've covered, but we have good questions in the Q&A, and I'm just going to throw them at you guys, okay? Mm. Um, cause some of them are for what's, what's the verdict for intermittent fasting in pregnant women go. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take it first? Who's been pregnant here before? A <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I didn't have to do you know, fasting at that point of time. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I would not sort of, uh, I, I would suggest not to do uh, intermittent fasting. I, I, I mean, probably something like uh, 12 hours of eating and 12 hours of fasting is something which is kind of safe. And, uh, you know, but do you think, do you yeah, think they can skip breakfast? Can they go to 14 hours? I think they could, for example, when I had my morning nausea in the first trimester, I did, I did have to skip breakfast because I just couldn't eat. And so yeah. it was okay. And so, yeah, I, as long as you get the necessary nutrients and the, you know, the required calories and you have a good uh, whole foods diet with all the proteins and you know, all the micronutrients, then that should be okay. But probably not too extended, I would say. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, I think the micronutrient composition and overall intake, as long as you're able to get that within that window, you could still get some benefits from restricting your window of eating without restricting the food as much um, and still experience some of the appetite benefits at least. Um, the, uh, there's another question. Uh, I would add to the pregnancy bit. Um, you have to know where you're starting because if you have pregnancy-related diabetes, uh, I think it's a great chance for a glucose meter. It's a great chance to understand when you need energy and when you have too much or the risk of not having enough. So again, contextualizing, the questions are great, but often we have to put them into context. So here's yeah. another question, uh, and I believe this, prolonged fasting um, could lower your immunity. And, and so is it advisable, how does that relate to the number of hours and or when do you think, is there an ideal time to fast? Like I try to do my one meal a day uh, and, and have, a, have a dinner and eat in the evening, but is one style better than another? And how does prolonged fasting impact immunity? Who wants to go first? Bonnie? Well, I, I, 
I, I, I'll jump in on, on immunity just because uh, it's something that we've been you know, talking about a lot lately. And you know, there's some great research recently out of UCLA that basically says after about 72 hours, you have almost completely rebuilt your immune system uh, on a cellular level, which, which is great. And there's, there's been a lot of documented benefits of that. However, you know, I know for a fact that I have done long fasts and, and I tend to, tend to fall apart a little bit towards the end of it. And I, I think that you can be a little more susceptible if you're going three, four, five days to, to, to some issues, to catching a cold, even though I think the long-term benefit outweighs the short term, I, I do think it's something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And there are some prolonged, so prolonged fasting can be a few types. I mean, there's the water fasting, which I think it's probably what Brad was doing. And then if you look at Dr. Longo's work, which is more of like a, a quarterly one to five days, but you know, you're eating like some plant foods, you know, small amounts, which is more like a fasting mimicking, which also seems to have positive effects in terms of immune function and longevity and things like that, which, uh, which I am agreeable to. And, and a lot of patients do feel better um, in terms of one particular fasting that's superior to others, I think what seems more reasonable and um, easily implementable for the individual is, is like the best. Like for you, after a day of clinic, if dinner is the one time you can have a peaceful meal, that's, that's one that works for you. Um, and, you know, and, and like that works for, for, for me and for some patients, breakfast is the only time they have with their family. So there's no way they're going to skip that meal. So, so it's, it, at the end of the day, it's whichever one you can start and stick to is, uh, is the best, you know, in, in my opinion, for, uh, in my experience with a lot of the patients. Part of one of the, that question and another one that's, that's on the Q&A is when does the autophagy benefit kick in? And, and again, Dr. Longo's work at USC would say, you know, really at, at about 72 hours, I think that if the you have to step back and ask, what's the purpose of my fast? And what do I want to get out of it? How could I measure that, if at all, quantitatively or qualitatively? And what, what Longo's work showed is that around 72 hours, you get cellular regeneration, not just in immunity, but in stem cells, whether it's bone marrow or gut stem cells uh, or cartilage. There's, you need to give it this pause so that the stem cells get the message of lower insulin, lower glucose, the metabolic triggers to, to create new stem cells. So it's really a regenerative process. But to answer that question, probably 48 and more likely 72 hours to get the autophagy benefit. Now the second question that was thrown in there is, um, when do you like to fast? Is it, you know, it, it, 16-8 is one thing, but is it the first 16 hours of the day? Is it the last 16 hours of the day? Uh, what do you think, Bonnie or Shrafi? Yeah, so, uh, go ahead, Bonnie, it's okay. There have been some studies that show, um, in particular, um, something in line with the circadian rhythm has been shown to improve metabolic health. So if um, people fit in most of their calories before 1 p.m., it actually helped improve their blood sugar, um, their free fat, fatty acids in the blood levels as well. Um, and that's probably because, you know, as humans, we were designed to, you know, hunt and gather in the daytime rather than at night. So um, if it fits into your lifestyle, then I would suggest to probably um, have more of your calories towards the earlier part of the day and then probably have a slightly lighter dinner um, rather than the other way around. Bonnie? Does intermittent fasting work equally well for men and women? Um, there have been some research that showed for women, it, it had some variable results. Um, and I think it also depends on what kind of fasting that women are doing. So I think the more extreme fasts, um, women tend to be more sensitive to um, calorie restriction than men. And they might you know, have some hormonal issues um, and, you know, having periods skipped and stuff. And that probably is because, you know, evolutionary wise, um, women are supposed to have, you know, babies when there are plenty of food. And if there's not much food around, so for example, by fasting really long hours, um, it might signal to the body that it's not, you know, a suitable time to make babies. 
Um, and so if fertility is something you're looking for, you might not want to do like something too extreme, like maybe just a, a slightly shorter kind of um, window of, of eating, something like maybe 16, 8 or um, even like a 12, 12 kind of fast that might be more suitable um, for women. Ashrafi, you take care of a lot of um, C-suite people who at least previously used to travel all yeah. the time and you're, you're coaching. I mean, I know that you like 16, eight, but is there a magic, uh, a, a magic time or a magic number? Uh, yeah, so uh, if it's, uh, so I've noticed in my practice and, you know, personally and uh, with patients is that for men, they somehow ma manage to do 24 hours of fa fasting, uh, you know, so maybe like you, one meal a day and <laughs> no issues and, you know, no issues, no hormonal issues, no feeling cranky, things like that. And, uh, you know, and some men who sort of entertain or on long haul flights, um, it is great because they can just sort of, uh, you know, fast for the entire duration of flight and not have their uh, fancy meals. So it might make good sense. And, but what, uh, so that can just be with coffee or tea or, you know, black coffee, black tea, green tea. But what I have noticed is women do sort of tend to, um, you know, find it a little tougher and they, they're not able to do uh, 16 or more than 18 hours. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so I then start, start and I, I sort of asked them to start, start slowly and, you know, move slowly towards 16. And then if they feel good, about it and then they can go on to 18 hours yeah yeah so, so maybe i mean not that i mean we're all based in singapore and i'm pretty sure the five of us are not leaving the island anytime soon but if you were taking that long haul flight from singapore to new york would you recommend fasting and no alcohol right now and and brad would you does that mean you you choose economy over business because you don't want the booze <laughs> <laughs> i <laughs> I typically don't eat uh, the whole time I travel. I try not to eat in the air, maybe pack some almonds or, uh, or something like that because uh, it just doesn't, doesn't do well for me when I gorge in, on planes. Um, yeah. But, you know, kind of, kind of on, the, on the same topic, I mean, I have seen, I have seen great benefit personally with 16-8. Uh, with and I've seen, I, I've tried it all different ways. And I think like everything else, you just have to try and experiment and start slowly and see what works for you. And, and for me, I can, if I chose today, I can go three days without eating with no problem. Um, and but I, I do know some people who there's just not a chance in the world they make it past you know, the 16 hour mark. So everyone's different, you, you just have to try. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the male female thing back on her point is, is a real thing, especially in, in athletes that, that we've seen. Uh, I think I would agree with you guys that, that men do seem to just kind of, to, to be able to do this a little easier with less, less, less oversight and less problems. And especially in, in the athletic world and the, 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 the high output world, women do seem to need a little bit more oversight and a little bit more tinkering with uh, the protocols that men do. This is, and this is hormonal. I mean, not, not to yeah. judge one way or the other, but this is the, the balance and the difference in, in the hormones within, yeah. within us. But one hormone we all share is thyroid hormones. Mm -hmm. And we have a half a dozen questions about if I have thyroid disease, if I have Hashimoto's, why can or can't I, and what is the best way to approach fasting? If, because it ties back to, People think it ties back to metabolism and slow metabolism. So Kartika, thyroid disease, low thyroid and fasting? Yeah. So if you have an underactive thyroid, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's no reason why you cannot practice fasting. The main thing that you need to be aware of is, um, you know, your biomarker. So most people with uh, thyroid disorders who are on medication are going to be routinely monitored by their endocrinologist. So start off with like the 16-8 or even a 14-10 um, and pay attention to what you are eating in the eating window as well. And then monitor your blood work rather than, you know, rather than being, being very um, cautious and not starting, start a, a slow version and then monitor your blood work and see how you're responding to that. And your doctor will then adjust your medication accordingly. Um, you know, that's my approach for someone with, um, with like an underactive thyroid who's a little bit worried about starting it. 
um, I would say start slow and go by you know results and documenting results. And keep in mind, thyroid testing probably shouldn't be done more than every six weeks. It takes time to really get up to get a trend as opposed to just that that snapshot. The trend has more value than a snapshot. Um, yep. Good. What about? Let's go back to again. It's timing of sixteen eight. Skipping breakfast. There, someone has made the the statement and, and raised the question that if I skip breakfast, it's evolutionary better that I, you know, eat breakfast like a king and lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper is the old saying. Is that valid? And should you know, I'm a sixteen eight person and I eat you know one large meal at the end of the day. Should I be switching that around, Bonnie? <laughs> I think if you look at the research, that's what it says. Um, I think for each person, it might work differently, though. Like, so if someone actually gets the mental health benefits of, you know, eating with their family and enjoying dinner, then just because that research says that, oh, there might be some marginal benefits in terms of metabolic health, it might be negated by, you know, not such good mental health in terms of not eating at the time where you actually prefer. So um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a bit hard to say that you definitely should, but you can always try and see if it works. If it doesn't, just switch back. And I think if, if it's working well for you now, then there's no reason for you to switch. Like if you have good and medical I, health and everything. Yeah. yeah, Brad, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I was just gonna add on to what Bonnie said as well, that, that it's also important to remember uh, some perspective is necessary here. If you decide to eat 16-8, and this is your protocol, if if your protocol is you I don't eat until, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you you don't, and if if on Sunday you want to go for a big breakfast with your family and your friends, I oh, think you sorry. should go for the big breakfast with your yeah, family and exactly. friends. And I think you should you'd enjoy that, and then get back on the wagon tomorrow. And if today you overwhelmed yourself with carbs at the big brunch and you drank a bunch of champagne. Tomorrow, just be mindful, have that eating window there, control it, maybe back off the carbs a little bit and move on with your life. It doesn't have to be a military regimen protocol. You can yeah. still live your life and zoom out and look at your entire eating over the course of the year, yeah. as opposed to, oh my God, I ate at 16 hours instead of 18 hours or whatever, whatever you broke for your own rule. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I, I yeah, agree. that's a big thing that the difference between fasting and starving, right? Starvation is not by choice. Fasting is a yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. a that's interesting a thing point. I, I want to come back to on starvation and, and, and stress, but as long as we're talking about breaking a fast, where does a bulletproof coffee fit? Does that mean I'm not fasting if I have coffee with MCT oil or coconut oil at 9 a.m.? Yeah. I <laughs> I mean, I I, 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 I agree that you are not you are not fasting. If you're if you're consuming uh, 500 calories in fat before lunch, that is not a fast. But it also you have to go back to like you said earlier. What is the point of the fast? What are my goals here? Uh, if if your if your goals are autophagy or or, or 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 anything like that, then yeah, that's gonna disrupt. If your goals are I'm trying to control my eating, keep my carbs down. But I feel like the bulletproof coffee or whatever you're, you're supplementing with or your exogenous ketones make me perform better, feel better, and I'm still eating clean and healthy, go for it. That's, that's your prerogative. Or sometimes do it and sometimes don't. If you feel like you need a bit of pick-me-up, go with a scoop of fat and butter in your coffee and, and go for it. Maybe tomorrow you won't need it. Um, but you are definitely in a fed state. Remember that if you're, if you're consuming any, any sort of calories whatsoever. Yeah. You might notice we've launched our first poll. We're about two thirds through our talk tonight, but uh, you know we're we're not totally techie over here, so we're we're playing with the Zoom features and have a poll. We'll, we'll close it in a few minutes. While that runs, um, the we've got another question here um, about how old you are. Is intermittent fasting more or less suitable at different ages in life? particularly um, women over 40. Yeah, so the interesting thing for women is, of course, and everybody can add to that, is there are different stages of life and the nutrition requirements really change dramatically for women, right? You have, you have the, the young athletes who literally may, may 
may miss periods, may not be able to, you know, may have reproductive issues. And then you have, you have the, the menopausal women or women over 40 who are reaching menopause who now have reduced iron requirements, increased calcium requirements and things like that. So it does make sense that the fasting would also have a different impact because their nutrient requirements are gonna be different, um, you know, for women at different stages. Uh, women over 40, you know, in general, people tend to lose muscle mass over time. So basically, if you're losing muscle mass, your metabolism is going to slow down because muscle burns, run, burns more. So you may have, take a longer time to respond to a fast or respond to any form of dietary change um, as, as, you, as you age, I mean, which, which is across the board uh, for men and women, but especially women because of all, like the hormonal and body composition changes. I don't know what you guys think about that. Uh, yeah, and that, and you know, what happens is as, uh, so about 40, whether it's men or women, I just think that, you know, fasting is a good way to promote healthy aging, uh, even if you don't do long fast, uh, you know, but if you just do like even a 16-8, uh, because you have better blood glucose control and better insulin levels, so it just helps. So uh, uh, about 40 would sometimes, you know, would be great for a woman to start fasting as well as a man. So, I, mean, I, I agree. Um, and I think that um, there have been studies that showed, especially in mice, so can't exactly say for humans because it's hard to do nutrition research, but in rats, um, it has been shown to increase longevity with fasting. Um, but there do need to be some precautions for older people. So especially if um, they're already underweight or struggling to get enough calories, or um, especially if they are taking medications that need food with it, then I think that might preclude um, the, um, you know, the possibility of doing intermittent fasting. So we have the results everyone should be able to see about the poll. Yeah. It looks like 80% uh, of the group here is doing it's something fasting, me. and nearly okay. two out of three are doing a 16 hour or 16 eight. So um, I, I think that consensus sort of shows in our small group here that it's it's doable if you're in the group that's not doing it i mean we encourage it but you have to listen to yourself and you if you need advice i mean i think that um whether it's you know our office or talking to your fitness trainers it's not a stretch to go 12 hours overnight and not take a meal or to wake up and you know even just have a meal and not do anything for the rest of the day it, it's pretty safe and it's useful to learn how you can, what you can do with your own body. Um, this, one of the things that you guys just said that I, I think is important, starvation is different than fasting. And starvation is being sort of externally forced upon you. Um, and it's usually very stressful. And, and one of the things about fasting or very prolonged fasts is that it creates a physical stress on the body which then alters your cortisol levels, your hormone levels, your adrenaline, which in response raise blood glucose through either burning of glycogen or burning of protein to make glucose, which is the last thing an athlete wants. And I think about that being a, a cancer specialist and, and how the body hijacks protein to be burned as glucose. But we also have some questions about marathon runners and can they do fasting? And someone else wants to know, define, says that they, they're having trouble meeting their whole basal metabolic requirements. So it gets back to how much do you eat in your feeding window, uh, different than just the breaking the fast. Isn't it hard to get in 2,200 calories for someone who might be running 20K every other week? Um, what do you guys think? Well, I, I, I think for, especially for endurance athletes, for marathon runners, for triathletes, um, it, it all depends on the athlete and other factors in their lifestyle. There's, there's you know, kind of the, the old mindset was for endurance athletes, sugar, 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 more sugar, more sugar. They're eating gel packs and bars and anything to, to keep the glycogen levels up and, and keep them you know, going with energy. And then there's a, there's a very new push of a kind of a ketogenic 
uh, low carb endurance athlete uh, who feel thing. like they can they can, burning. yeah, they can thrive better on ketones and not need to rely on supplementing with sugar. And you know, overall, it's probably better for your your, your entire system than than just feeding yourself sugar every day. So I I, I just think it depends. Uh, but if you're if you're burning an extra two to three thousand calories a day with some high output activity, it is going to be very hard to yeah. to to give yourself the nutrition that you need in six or eight hours. That's just, and that's I, just a fact. I would throw in that that's going to reduce your immunity. So the 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 and we see this a lot. In, yeah. I used to see it in my triathlete friends. They burn the candle at both ends, professional or amateur. And without enough energy on board and the physical stress of staying up or waking up early for cycling, it's a, it's a very big physical stress on the body that is the opposite of autophagy. Um, and it's one of the things about fasting and autophagy is that it's enough of a stress that it builds resilience followed by recovery, whereas a starvation is perhaps too long I mean, if it's, I mean, obviously you don't have to create historical analogies for starvation, but it's the, if you go too far, push yourself too hard, you may not get the immune benefits. You may get resilience. You know that you can be thrown on a deserted island for 30 days, but the fact of the matter is that's not, you can get a lot of resilience, 95% of that resilience with three days. So... I, I think that's really important. Yeah, it's about defining that personal boundary of like, how long can I go without falling apart? Like for Brad, that might be five days. For me, it might be two. <laughs> so, you know, our personal limits do differ um, in terms of what we can, we can endure. And also, if you're, if you're an athlete that's such a high output athlete, I think it's important to rethink what is your personal need to do the intermittent fasting or the time-restricted eating. What is it offering you that your already planned, regimented, you know, nutrition intake is not offering you? Um, and, and, and if you want to do it during your off seasons where you're not training as much and you wanted to do an extended fast for autophagy, that's fine. But is there really a benefit for you to be doing like 16 eights constantly and then stressing about squeezing meals and then going to bed with a heavy stomach and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. What about, uh, do athletes or anyone need supplements? when they're doing intermittent fasting? Uh, I, I, can, I can say from experience that yes, you do. I, I personally have, uh, I need to supplement when doing, doing fasting with, with sodium, with, uh, with magnesium, uh, and things of that nature, because I, I sweat a lot when I train. I'm a big guy out running in, in the Singapore sun, and I, I'll, I'll find my legs cramping at night and, uh, and not feeling so good. So I, I definitely recommend, and again, it goes, you know, if you're making a big change and jumping into this, get some get some blood work done and see where your baseline is at. You know, before you get started and, and all to make sure you, you get at it quickly. But there's there's a very good list of uh, of, of recommended supplements that uh, some folks have put out that I think we should probably share in the in the notes after this um, mm -hmm. because I, I think especially with intermittent fasting and I guess it, it's a big difference. Intermittent fasting, I think for the most part, you can get away with it by just you know skipping breakfast or skipping dinner. But if you want to go anything over that 16 hour window, I think you should probably look at, um, especially if you're exercising, look at some sort of supplementation. Yeah, yeah. And, and supplements in, in, in exercise, um, often, you know, people think it's, it's got to be like, like one of those sweetened beverages or protein shakes that yeah. have a lot of things added in it. But uh, most of the times what people need is fluid and electrolytes. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, and the ones that Brad talked about, um, we often over supplement with, with some of these sports drinks and, and all of those things that probably some of the athletes that Brad works with needs because they're exercising three, four hours, maybe in the hot sun. Mm -hmm. But most of us who are doing it for fitness don't really need. Um, and it's offsetting the benefit of exercise. So um, we've got a question about, can you get the benefits of, of autophagy or achieve autophagy, I guess, um, just from caloric restriction without the actual fasting. And, and, and my, my first answer, and I, I'm going to want Kartika to sort of comment further, but um, one of the things that we love about fasting in the office is that we've developed a protocol for periodic fasting or a what's called a fasting mimicking diet around chemotherapy treatment. So 
it's, it was devised by, uh, again, Dr. Longo at USC, and it's a uh, fasting mimicking diet, or FMD, allows people to eat about somewhere between 500 and 800 calories a day, mostly of plant-based uh, materials, to give them the sense of eating. And really what it's doing is avoiding insulin. And maybe Kartika, you could use you know, 30 seconds to talk about what we see and how we, we do that with the oncology patients, because it's shocking. Most people think, oh, someone's got cancer. They're worried about starving. We better feed that person. Emotionally, they give them cheesecake. They give them ice cream, their favorite foods. When in fact, and, and I'll share it here. I mean, when, when Kartika joined our practice more than a year ago, she was an oncology nutritionist helping cancer patients gain weight. And we sort of flipped that around over here and said, we're gonna help people not get cancer by losing fat. So tell them about the diet. I think it's worth mentioning. No, absolutely. And I think it ties in a little bit to one of the questions about like what's considered still fasting, right? So when our patients do um, the fasting mimicking protocol, uh, they essentially, they're essentially allowed to eat stuff like cucumbers and celery and broccoli and cauliflower, where it takes a lot for your body to digest it and it doesn't have a lot of starch content. So it's not really spiking your blood glucose level. And to put it in a layman's perspective, if your blood glucose is not spiked, that means you're actually starving some of the cancer cells of glucose. Because normal cells can look for other sources of fuel, whereas cancer cells are like craving glucose. So oh. it's actually... Sorry? Only glucose. Yeah, yeah. only glucose. So it's when our patients come in, some of them are already doing one meal a day. They're already familiar with fasting. Then we tell them, oh, you could do a water fast with just some, uh, some electrolytes and broth, right? But then we have patients who come in and that's the first time they're hearing about fasting and they're cancer patients. We tell them, just eat some non-starchy vegetables, have some soup, have some broth, for the 24 hours to 48 hours leading into chemotherapy and the 24 hours after chemotherapy. Anecdotally, most of our patients do really well because we, we closely monitor the medications and things. Um, they also you know, have better quality of life because having worked in a setting where we did not practice this, I know that my patients have less side effects now when they're eating less compared to when they're eating more or drinking some of those sweetened supplements that are offered in a more conventional setting to help them bulk up, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about bone broth? Is that allowed? Ashrafi, you love bone broth. I mean, in, uh, in a fasting, which is 16-8, like we discussed, no, <laughs> it would break the fast. But uh, if you're doing a longer fast, uh, then that's a great way to sort of hydrate yourself because it has a lot of nutrients, a 24 hours fast, 36 hours fast, uh, bone broth is great. And uh, micro, it has a lot of uh, micronutrients and it sort of uh, energizes you. So yes, I love bone broth too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Our <broth> specialist. <laughs> so we haven't ventured we're, we're running you know we've got seven minutes to go i want to sort of looking at the polls here um it looks like or let me uh, share the poll as we probably would have guessed most of the of the audience is doing 16 8 uh 20 percent doing one meal a day um and not a lot of people reporting maybe that was a poll style i I don't know if I gave all the options, but uh, three-day or alternate day fasting. So again, 16-8 is quite, quite doable. Yeah. The thing I wanted to ask, we haven't covered mental health and fasting. Um, I see a lot of people with anxiety, um, uh, with uh, depression, and changing their diet seems to make a big impact. What do you guys see? And... and if somebody said, I want to do intermittent fasting because I'm depressed, is that, you know, useful? Is it, um, is it harmful? What do you think? So if it's, uh, you know, again, it comes back to, is it an eating, is, you know, do they have a diagnosed eating disorder? And if it is not, um, you know, there are some small studies that are saying that um, fasting does alter gut microbiome. And, you know, like, I know, Dr. Tucker, you're passionate about, you know, the gut-mind connection. And it is not a stretch to think that, you know, when people are fasting, that they're going to make better food choices when they do break the, break the fast. And hence, they're going to 
change their gut microbiome. It's, it's worth a try, especially the shorter fasts. Um, I don't see them as harmful and they're really good for appetite control. So if someone is like a stress eater or someone uses food to cope with some of those emotions and fasting helps you regulate your appetite, then why not? That's my take. Yeah, I, Karthik, I completely agree with you as well. I, and I think it's important, it's important to remember as well that appetite signaling hormones are trainable, um, you know, a, a, as well. And I think that's something that, that, that people have a hard... We lost Brad. Yeah, we lost Brad. I put up a poll about leaving and he just walks out. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, um, part of the question is, are there any tips for improving sleep related to this? And I actually, tell me what you, you three think. I've had the experience with both personally and, and some patients, when they start fasting, uh, at just like with keto, they get more energy that they, that they feel pretty amazing. Uh, and so it becomes... Um, they have more, Brad's back. Uh, thanks, Brad. Miss yeah. me. We talked about you. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about sleep and uh, any tips for sleep. And I was mentioning that sometimes keto and fasting gives you what I would call psychic energy and you're up all night. But what tips do we have for helping people sleep? I mean, I, I, sorry to jump on you, but I, I, I know that, you know, and there's a lot of studies to back this up, but if I eat, you know, less than two hours before bed, a, a large meal, it disrupts my sleep. And with the aura ring and the Garmin and all my sleep tracking data nerd devices all tell me when I wake up, hey, you had a pretty bad night's sleep. And the aura ring is going to the point of going, did you have a large meal last night before you went to bed? Um, and it's it almost always you. right. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you have to, you, you do, you know, eating a large meal before bed definitely disrupts sleep. So if you're squeezing that window and trying to fit in all your day's calories as the day goes on, it, it, can, it can cause some issues. Yeah, yeah. And I answered one of the questions, a participant asked, can I have, if I'm doing 16, eight, can I eat at 10 and go to bed at 11? Not a yeah. good idea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's, yeah. You, you definitely want to eat your meal uh, earlier. Yeah. And, uh, Personally, I, I have got a lot of energy as well because Dr. Taka mentioned about energy. And I, I find myself, I mean, just by doing 16, 8, I have tremendous amount of energy. And just to share a personal experience, that I actually get up in the morning, uh, skip breakfast and do, uh, I mean, I'm not like Brad, you know, like doing all the heavy weights. But yeah, whatever. Your Brad's like Brad. <laughs> but, but I can do uh, the hit and the uh, resistance bands and the resistance training without eating anything, without even drinking tea. And I, I just find uh, so much better, uh, you know, uh, energy and, um, you know, I'm, my muscle building. I mean, don't look at my muscles now. They're, the gyms are not on, but yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. So yeah. I, I have a lot of energy. So, I think also it, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was just, just saying that it, pr Fasting prevents the glucose spike. So it prevents the sugar crash that a lot of us experience. So it actually gives us that sustained energy, right? Like we all hear about kids sugar crashing after eating like really sweet food. That's because they get that sugar high and then they get an exaggerated insulin response and then a sugar crash. It's the crash that's really bad that makes people feel like they don't have energy. So if you don't have a high, you don't experience the low and you stay, you actually have a more sustained energy. Um, yeah. with that. And, and that also impacts back to the brain health and, and your thoughts because it's going to change that that high and a low is a huge stressor and it's met by if if you ate oh I don't know a bag of Pringles a can of Pringles with a Mountain Dew and uh, and and a chocolate bar you're you're sky high but you're also getting the opioid effect on the brain that you are getting a, an actual high, that you feel giddy or buzzy, followed by the crash, and your neuropeptides are just seeking out that, that same buzz over and over, yeah. and it creates a yo-yoing effect mm -hmm. that is horrible for your gut bacteria, horrible yeah. for your behaviors. Uh, go ahead, Brad, you wanted to say something? 
No, I mean, it's your, your, it's, I, I, I mean, the name of Ian and I's company that holds ritual is cheat day because we, you know, we came up with our best ideas to running businesses on cheat days when back, you know, 10 years ago, we would just, it was awful. We would just eat perfect. We were both athletes and competitive and we would eat perfect all week. And then either Saturday or Sunday, we would just lose our minds and multiple pizzas and ice cream. And then what you find is the next morning you wake up and you wake up ravenous for more carbohydrates. You want sugar. I want to eat a bowl of cereal right now, even though I don't eat cereal. And then I finally personally went through this, like, well, I'm living like a crazy person. I'm living all six days of the week just so I can eat like a maniac on Sunday. And then I wake up on Monday and just want to keep eating like a maniac and have to fight that all day until that's all out of the system. Uh, so you, you do have to be careful with that ping pong effect and back and forth of carbs, no carbs, sugar, no sugar, fed, not fed. You have to, you have, to have some sort of self-control in there. Otherwise, you can, you can make yourself go a bit mad. Before yeah. I forget, you brought up, I mean, ritual that you and Ian formed and the, and the parent company, of course, but um, I don't want to, we, we did a poll and clearly 92% uh, of you want us to keep going. So your, your delivery is not there or you're fasting longer. <laughs> so we'll, we'll push out for another 10 minutes or so. But I don't want to forget, um, Brad, do you want to give one minute on ritual anywhere? And, and what, you know, sort of what, what happened is you, I, I can tell everyone that You've taken what was Singapore's best boutique gym, expanded it across Singapore, and then got the brilliant idea to put it across the world. And then yeah, and then and then the coronavirus made us close all of them. Um, <laughs> temporarily. So, <laughs> temporarily, yeah, temporarily. Uh, but we, you know, so we we we've launched uh, we've launched our you know taking the same ritual workouts and logic and, and system that we have in place around the world. We put it into an app. Um, that uh, we've been testing for a couple of weeks now with ritual members around the world. Uh, and I think in the next, you know, 48, 72 hours, it's going to be available for the public. Um, so, you know, everyone who's signed up for this will, will happily send the link out in the next day or two to, to folks uh, with, with free access to come in and, and give it a try. So that way you can, you can add a little HIIT to your, to your intermittent fasting experiments. One of the things we started up at the beginning of the hour was talking about how intermittent fasting is kind of a hack and that at least for you and me, um, we, we think about, I mean, there's different things about biohacking and it's, it's, it's an efficiency. And so not eating is an easier, if I don't want to decide what to eat, not eating is a healthy choice for me. And I would just throw it out there that the way that you and Ian have approached fitness, cardio, strength, it is a hack and that you know it, it's it's great now because it's it's not just it, it's it's independent of time and place when you have it on the app because it's it's literally it's like a ritual i do this it's 20 minutes i get it out of the way if you're someone who doesn't like exercise but you get the same autophagy benefits the sleep benefits the strength benefits so i, I mean i just want to make sure that people know that's why i i, I like it so. Yeah, I mean the two, the two, especially the the shortened work that we do, you know, 20, 20 minutes or so for 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 hard intense work. Yeah. That along with you know some well regulated, well supervised, smart uh, intermittent fasting protocols or time restricted protocols really are a match made in heaven. It's it's yeah. what Ian educated me on years ago, and then you know you you you'll burn the glycogen in your liver and your muscles while you sleep. But if you get up in the morning and you, you get a good workout in and you deplete your glycogen stores during a fast, you're going to get exponential benefits from the work that you've put in during that discipline. I'm not going to eat. You'll get huge benefits hormonally, uh, physically, physiologically. You'll get big, big returns from that. So that's the two go together quite well. Benefits on the liver. We've got a question in. Uh, long fast and drinking alcohol. How bad is that? Does it ruin everything? How bad is it, Brad? What's, I don't know. What's the difference between having a glass of wine and having a fruity cocktail? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, it's really, listen, you guys, you guys see patients. I, I just have anecdotal conversations with people around the world, but it is the number one question that we get is, how does alcohol fit into this whole intermittent fasting thing? I want thing? The, the nutrition team to comment because it's one thing to have a unit of alcohol but what happens when you have it with fruit juice? What if yeah. you have a, a Singapore sling as opposed to just a you know shot of tequila? Yeah. 
So alcohol is a toxin on the liver. So, and the liver is a big part of regulating your blood sugars and, and a lot of these things. Um, and fruit juice contains something called fructose, which is a type of sugar. So alcohol and fructose almost have similar toxic effects on, on your liver, which is why I think all of us agree that if we can chew, we shouldn't be drinking juice. Um, so, you know, either choose juice <laughs> or choose alcohol, um, you know, because that's really going to put a stress on your liver uh, a lot. It's, yeah. And when you think about it, I mean, everyone knows to measure that we measure blood glucose, but we never measure blood fructose. And everyone thinks fructose is so uh, acceptable because it comes from nature. It comes from fruits. It's, it seems like a natural product, but fructose is a, technically it's a five ring carbon. It doesn't look anything like glucose and the liver has to do more work to metabolize that. You don't get to use it as energy. You don't, you don't take fructose tablets when you're, you know, when you're trying to raise your blood sugar because it's glucose that matters. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not against a daiquiri, but you certainly wouldn't want to break your fast with a daiquiri. It's just going to be more than a, you know, it's going to be synergistically bad uh, yeah. for, the, for the liver. Um, looking through what other questions, we've covered a lot of them. Uh, da, 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 extended cravings. How do, you, how do you manage your cravings? Brad, like a gigantic glass of water. What do you do with cravings? So first of all, there, there's, I'll give you 30 seconds. So the first 10 to 14 days of experimenting with any sort of fasting, is your trial period. And much like going to a low carb diet, you're gonna see some effects that you might have to power through. If you're not fat adapted, if your body's not used to kicking in and producing ketones when it's, at, when it's out of glycogen, you, you might experience some friction that you have to overcome. And, and if you get beyond that, you will know if you're hungry. Like I know at this point intuitively, if I had a big training day yesterday, if I wake up in the morning, sometimes my body says, we need to eat right now. And I know that I'm underfed and I need some calories. So, you know, I guess, I guess the question can be answered like everyone else here. Everyone's different. Start slowly and experiment and figure out, figure out what works for you. Ashrafi, what do you tell clients when they have cravings? Um, so when, I, I, I mean, when people have cravings and the first thing I tell them is uh, drink a glass of water. Yeah. If that doesn't mm -hmm. work, uh, you know, go for a walk, like a, maybe walk around the office, walk around your home, see, it, see with the 10 minutes of having a glass of water sort of stops your cravings. Because most of the time, as Brad said, it's a, uh, it, it may not really be a hunger. It may be craving something else. It may be a psychological thing. And yeah. then if that doesn't work, then maybe you want to try some a healthier version of a craving. So, yeah, so if you feel like having some, uh, you know, say, um, maybe a roti prata, you don't want to go and have a roti prata. You probably want to have a cauliflower pizza. <laughs> Bonnie, do you have any different craving uh, management recommendations? I think if um, you're keeping yourself busy, that's one way to actually, you know, forget about food like if you're you know accomplishing things you're um you know ticking things off your to-do list you're you know, doing housework exactly. you kind of put exactly. your mind off food so that's one way that you can kind of you know get rid of the craving and i think if you know after the fast you're still craving it maybe your body really wants it and yeah you can choose like a healthier version like what ashrafi says kartika yeah. Um, there was one of our participants who asked about, a, um, you know, our opinion on a book called Delay, Don't Deny. Yeah. Um, I have not personally read that book, but, you know, the thing with intermittent fasting or like any form of fasting, if you are delaying your meal, you're not completely denying yourself of all of good things in life, which to me is mostly food. So, you know, I think that there's... There's that psychological aspect, which is craving, and then there's physiological hunger. It's always good to get through the craving so that you're eating for hunger. So, you know, hunger is like a wave in that sense that you can delay that and make a better choice later on than acting on it immediately. Um, All right. I've got one real question, and then I got a rapid fire question. Um, the, when you're doing 16 8, 
is it better to work out fasted or after you break the fast? Can I answer that? Sure. A fasted. Okay. Because it just helps you burn through so much more fat. So much more fat, yeah. And, uh, you know, and it, uh, it uh, I mean, I personally find that, you know, if you if weight loss is why you are doing the 16-8, then definitely uh, exercise and in the fastest state. Brad, any yeah. other comments? Completely agree. I, I, I'm always shocked when you go to the gym, somebody's drinking these protein shakes, you know, before they, they go into the climb. Like, do you really need that? I mean, yeah. I mean, when you were fighting professionally, maybe, but I don't think I've ever been in a competitive state that I needed a, a protein shake before my workout. Right. But yeah. it, while, yeah. while, I, while I'm on the treadmill. Like, but I never, Ian treadmill. never trained me also, so that, that could be <laughs> Okay, rapid fire. My last question, what is the biggest mistake that someone makes when they start out fasting? Kartika. Um, I can eat anything I want because I fasted for 20 hours. Mistake number one. Bonnie. Mm, I, like binge eating afterwards, you know, like, because I think, yeah, same thing as what Katika says. Avoid binging. Ashrafi? Um, I can't do fasting. Uh, you know, it's not possible. It's too difficult. Brad? Uh... I would say a bit more philosophical, not having a good intention when they go into it. Not, if, you, if you do it just because you've heard fasting is a thing, uh, that's one thing. But if you, if you set an intention out, I'm doing this because of this, and this is the results I'm looking for, I think it just helps, just helps clear the path the whole way. I, I totally agree. For me, it's always about the why. You know, if somebody wants to take a supplement, I always ask why. If they want to believe that, you know, their behavior um, is going to help with their condition. I want to know why. And if you give me anything reasonable, including a because I believe in it personally, I'm with you. And that creates a positive psychology that, that, that just helps people. So with that, um, I'm going to say thank you to the four of you. This was great. Um, I appreciate everyone answering our polls. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, we wanted to know about, I'll share with you how you found us and we found you at different connections, but, um, overall we will do our best to share this information with you. I'm not going to commit to the methodology just yet, but I know that the nutrition team has a lot more questions. We'll look at the notes and what we had pre-prepared and, uh, we look for, I look forward to doing this again. Um, on the same topic or variations on this topic. Uh, thank you all. Um, stay safe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Now. Anyone? Oh, is the recording? Uh, yeah. I don't, there's a question about the recording. Recording, yes. There's a question about recording. What is the question? I don't is see it available? It. Are they going to have it, access? It will be available. It will ultimately be available. So that just requires uh, work and we'll get it done. But yes. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks for, thanks for tuning uh, in. Take care and have a good same day.